Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we begin a five-day program on China with the theme that China is not our enemy. Uh, as we begin the program, I think it's important for us to uh, set a little bit of context, which we'll uh, do today. Uh, I want to begin by just recalling that the United States now is escalating conflict with two superpowers simultaneously. At Humanity Rising, we have been tracking the escalating tensions and, in fact, proxy war between the United States and Russia in Ukraine, a conflict that is getting more and more dangerous day by day with an increasing probability of a nuclear exchange. Uh, the world has not been at this level of danger of a nuclear war uh, since the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962. And that is something that all of us uh, need to take in as we contemplate how we live our lives, what issues we should be uh, addressing. Uh, we need to uh, bear in mind that the conflict between these two superpowers uh, is escalating uh, in increasingly uh, dangerous ways. At the same time, uh, the United States is escalating a uh, conflict with China with uh, increasingly uh, specific rhetoric uh, articulated by several of the people in the uh, U.S. military about the uh, increasing probability of war against China, uh, one general predicting war by no later than 2025 uh, over Taiwan. So we find ourselves in a situation of an extraordinary um, contradiction. All of us are aware that we should be dealing with escalating climate turbulence as global warming and the ecological chaos that ensues is getting more and more accelerated more and more severe uh, everywhere around the world. At no time in human history has it been more urgently necessary for not only the superpowers, but every nation on earth to come together in enhanced cooperation uh, to deal with uh, escalating climate disaster, which is affecting all of us. But that's not what's happening. Instead, uh, the United States has chosen uh, to escalate tensions uh, with Russia, with China, uh, as part of a global strategy articulated 30 years ago by the neoconservatives uh, that the United States would use the unipolar moment with the collapse of the Soviet Union to ensure global primacy, global supremacy, and would take any action necessary uh, to uh, ensure that no other power on earth uh, could challenge uh, the primacy of the United States. And that is what is now being played out uh, in the escalating tensions uh, with Russia and China. We've had uh, uh, two summits on Ukraine, uh, and this is our first uh, summit on China. Uh, we've convened these uh, summits with Code Pink, uh, one of the most uh, dynamic and uh, effective peace organizations in the United States uh, and around the world. Uh, so we want to welcome all the uh, Code Pink uh, listeners and all of you in the humanity a rising global community in over 130 countries. And however you're listening through Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube and through our live streaming partners, uh, we wanna welcome you. As Humanity Rising seeks to 
elevate code red issues, but to do so in a way that not only informs, but catalyzes collaborative action so that we, the people of the world, can not only know what's really going on, uh, but also can take the kind of actions that are required uh, to compel our governments uh, to remedy situations that only the governments in the end uh, can solve. And the issue of war and peace, uh, the issue of whether we're going to use nuclear weapons or not, uh, are uh, those kinds of critical, ultimately governmental issues. Uh, and the sad tragedy of our world uh, is that our governments are not living up to their responsibilities and therefore the accountability to ensure that they do uh, resides with we, uh, the people. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce now Jody Evans, the one of the co-founders of Code Pink, uh, who's been co-moderating these summits uh, with me over the last uh, six months or so. Uh, she will be uh, talking about the plans for the week, setting context uh, for what we're going to be considering, uh, introducing our guest, and then we'll circle back for a discussion for the balance of the time. But Jody, thank you so much uh, for everything that you've uh, done with us. And I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to um, our summits on peace. Uh, yes, China is not our enemy. Uh, that was uh, the title I, I decided to name this campaign because I was listening to a lot of lies and hate on China that was surprising me and a lot of propaganda. And I realized, oh, this is just like the Iraq war all over again. It had the same pattern. It was happening in the same way. They were the same exaggerations and lies that not a normal person shouldn't actually take in. And my response was, but China is not our enemy. We must cooperate for the concerns we have on the planet, for the people and the planet especially with climate change, we must be in cooperation with China. So that's how this started. Um, and I wanna thank you for being here because it really is how we build a movement is that we, we ourselves get the confidence of our own voice to be a tuning for, for peace. There is so much misinformation out there that um, people just wanna, crawl under a hole because it's it's argument and um and lies and they're they're being filled with hate and distrust and it is up to each one of us to be an antidote to that and so peace is never about arguing peace is about offering different positions and not being attached to yours except it is important that it enter the room because this propaganda that we're seeing on Ukraine and on China is deep. And it's what people hold on to. So we have to have a lot of compassion for the people have intentionally, with effort and money, um, their, their hearts and minds, I say, have been weaponized for war. And we have to have patience with that. So what gives us strength is knowing other things that are stronger stones to stand on. I find the lines, lies are actually easy to crack through once you give truth, because truth is, is actually a stronger standing place and people want that. Um, so I, I wanna thank you for being here, for wanting to learn, wanting to know, and I hope wanting then to share, because that's the, as much as it, that's the next most important thing after listening and learning. So um, I want to just give you an overview for the week. There's so much about China and about this campaign that I wanted to structure it in a way that you had um, what I felt you needed to at least start a, a deeper dive in. So um, the campaign was launched three and a half years ago. So there's a lot of information on the website and later I'll, I'll post some links. 
tomorrow, today we're just going to do an overview and we've got Wei who's going to talk to us both about what it was like with the pivot to Asia being in China and then what it was like to be Asian American, Asian in, in the US going to college. So we can, we can get that really intimate look. Tomorrow, we will look into China, the culture, history, political structure. Wednesday, we'll look at the propaganda and how that has already paying, people paying the cost of this war and where that propaganda comes from. And then Thursday, we'll hear from Asian Americans who are paying the price. And Friday, we'll try to answer more of your questions and then how we can all be tools for peace and what's happening, what you can engage in, what you can share. Um, it's a huge subject. China is a huge subject. Um, so first, starting with China is not our enemy. China is beautiful. It has a 3,000 year culture. And that culture at the core of it holds peace. At the very core of it is how do we get along? Confucius uh, has a lot to do with that, um, which was really at a time where that arose to answer the question of how do we live together? And so, you know, how do you live in relationship, in respect of, in the understanding of the, the whole, at, which is a very hard thing to for Western um, uh, people to understand because we live so such individualistic lives and we kind of are in a pool of narcissism uh, because that's even what the media talks about. But what is it to be related in a way that the earth, your, your country, your community and your family are as much a part of you as you are? Um, is something I think it's a stretch for us to understand. But that's been there. And also there's been this uh, commitment uh, that those who uh, rule a country are responsible to the people. So that's also very old and, and expected. So, you know, like the under heaven, it needs to feel like you're under heaven um, or the, the leaders aren't doing their job. I also want to say I was just in Dali and I'm going to flow through this with having just spent a, a month in China. And one of the things I learned was that 1200 years ago in this place where there was leaders of this whole area of China's vast, um, at some point the, the ruler would leave his his post of, as a ruler and move into the temple and become a monk. And I thought, wow, in this time where people in power in the United States, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I have to say in the United States, they will not relinquish power. We have a Senator who won't let go. Um, it's crack cocaine, this power. And I don't think it's meant to be that way. Uh, it's been so created in this structure that it's really just crack cocaine. They, they won't let go of it. And I thought it was interesting that um, they move the, the, even the value of philosophy and uh, the connection to um, that which helps us be healthy um, is, is at the core of this culture. Now, it is also a culture that's in modernity. It is complex, it is enormous. It's almost a billion and a half people. So to say China is uh, uh, also insane. Um, it is made up of many, many ethnic um, Chinese minorities. It's made up with vast differences of uh, bioclimates, bioregions, histories, uh, different even smaller histories because it is a collection of places. So what's happening in one can have, you know, little to do with what's happening in another. And that is still true. Um, you know, what it's like to live in the 
freezing cold of northern China and the balmy heats of southern China, it, you know, create even different personalities as we know this globally. So to say China is, you know, we need to hold in our mind the vastness of also diversity. So um, when we started this campaign, uh, what I recognized was that there was a lot of propaganda and it was targeted at the progressive movement. Um, my movement, <laughs> you know, the part that the, my community, the place that I'm part of. And those, uh, it was definitely weaponizing the, the beautiful hearts and minds, the, 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 the compassion and the empathy of those that are progressives. And so as I, the first year I felt like I, this community of, of um, China is not our enemy, we really spent in educating that we couldn't let those we love be used for war. And the State Department, the Pentagon had thrown out what I call a lot of weeds to, to, to grab people. And then if you started to go in the weeds and talk about how that wasn't true, you got kind of grabbed in, a, in a, an argument, which I didn't feel was useful. And then it was like, let's just move up to China is not our enemy and stay out of the weeds. That is enough. So we did about a year of work of pulling the progressives off from being used for war. And that took a lot of education, a lot of one-on-one -on -one education. They literally wanted Ilan Omar to be the poster child for this going to war with China. So reminding people that there is no greater violation of human rights than war. There is no greater violation to the planet than war. There, you know, like all these places that you're being dragged into the weeds, war, we're forgetting the costs of war. We have forgotten the costs of war. We, we get a lot of manipulation, we get a lot of hate, but when do we actually have to sit for a day and really be with what the costs of war are? And I know, you know, Jim and I talked to a lot of people in Ukraine. We are not getting this in our media. We're getting driven to war. We're getting manipulated to war. But the costs of war, I think would help us change that the capacity that we have to be dragged in and be used by. So this campaign is about, there is a beautiful place. It is complicated as we are. It has as many complications as the United States, but who are we to tell it who to be? What we should be is saying, we all have to get along on this planet that is fragile. We need to be cooperating on climate change. We need to be cooperating on poverty. We need to be cooperating on how we live together instead of creating more wars and more devastation and more death and more people homeless, but with the refugees and those at home, because we're taking United States taxpayer money to fund this. And they wanna go back to that funding piece. The beginning when Bush and, and family, Bush and friends were pushing for this war on Iraq that I, you know, that kind of brings me into this story. They told us that it was going to cost no more than $200 billion. That was what Rumsfeld was saying to members of Congress. The 20 years of the war on terror cost $22 trillion of taxpayer money. $22 trillion. Not only does it create a culture of weaponization and war and hate and other, you know, creating an enemy, but it has robbed that $22 trillion from the needs of the people of the United States and literally undermined the infrastructure. So I want to talk about like what China did in that same 20 years. It didn't invest any very little in its military. It, its budget for the military did not raise. And it spent its money 
building the infrastructure for its people and for the planet. It built infrastructure that would take down their uh, contribution to climate change. Uh, China, I think, is the only country, I think maybe there's three others, that have come to where they agreed in, in Paris. So they took that money and instead decided to serve the people on the planet. And in the same period of time, they took 800 million people out of poverty. So, you know, let's, let's look at that also. And then we have the United States under Obama pivoting to Asia. And, you know, that pivot um, had many reasons, but mostly that the United States could see that China was growing as an economic power. It had failed in the Middle East. It had basically destroyed a lot of the Middle East. And with that, Northern Africa, it didn't want to talk about it anymore. It didn't want to be engaged anymore. It's just like, let's just move to fresh territory. And so it started, you know, upping the military. Um, and, and I just want to say the pivot to Asia is not just about China. Um, and and we, sh we should remember that. And, and with Ukraine, we, we, we talked about in the summit, we've watched BRICS rise, but um, it was a pivot to China, India, and Indonesia, which represent close to 4 billion people on the planet. And so it, it's a market, <laughs> it's a power, it's a, the power of you know, them all coming into their, strength as as countries um, really spending time strength to comment on leadership is to comment on the country itself the country the people have moved into modernity um, and have moved into ways to make their citizens happier and that's true for china india and indonesia that doesn't mean all the people are happier but it it it's where we are in the United States, there's a lot of unhappiness. You have to look at, there's 4 billion people that are happier than people in the United States, pretty much. So just kind of understand what was what's happening. It was a lot about the economy and a lot about having military control over a place that the Obama and th those in power didn't feel like they had enough control. And for much of that time, they, deployed the State Department and many people into engaging themselves in summits, in meeting with the governments, in creating partnerships. And But it's, I, I wanna say it's where the rules-based order kind of started seeping up. You have to be part of our rules-based order as we've seen Biden kind of embrace fully. But the United States has 250 or more bases surrounding China. And um, that costs a lot to the people there, near those bases, in those bases, the planet that it destroys, the pristine ecosystems it destroys. And I wanna say, Code Pink, we've, we've been engaged at, at, at trying to stop some of them, including the one in Jeju Island in, in South Korea, because it was one of the most beautiful pristine ecosystems you've ever seen. And they decided to destroy it with a military base. So this pivot to Asia is pretty ugly um, in its expression. Um, so, you know, we've seen with the Ukraine war also that NATO uh, that belongs, you know, in, in Europe is also pivoting to Asia and we've got NATO moving to around China. Um, so uh, that which has nothing to do with peace and should have nothing to do with Asia. Also, I want to just say there, China does have one other base. It's in Djibouti, um, but that was because the United States asked them to participate in anti-piracy operations and to build that base. Um, now with the US sent, bringing weapons to Taiwan, China, of course, has to respond by upping its military spending, which it had resisted doing. But when you start to, you know, a war on someone, they have to race to meet you. So this is part of the problem we don't want to have happen, because now 
with um, uh, U.S. wanting to spend another couple of trillion dollars on new nuclear weapons, what can China do but meet that? Uh, any leader in another country that's watching the military arise to, you know, and threatening war on it, generals say that's going to happen in two years, you have to respond. And I think that's one of the crimes of this U.S. war on China, is that it's just creating more weapons on the planet, which we should not have. The other thing that we saw at the beginning of this is the propaganda um, creates xenophobia, the hate and the lies of which there are many, which is on purpose, which I think is another crime to hate on another, to create an enemy of another. How juvenile, how five-year-old, you know, this is, this is, you know, I mean, actually you learn not to do that in kindergarten. This is, you know, distorted and and um, really grown up a behavior grown ups should not be engaged in um, because it has effects. And we saw very early on the, the effects of this with a rise of like three thousand percent in xenophobia and violence against Asians. And I want to say Asians because in the United States, most people first of all know nothing about Asia, but also know don't know what country you're from when you're Asian. And so that meant that everyone that was Asian is pulled under the umbrella and are vulnerable to the attacks, to the xenophobic hate attacks. And, um, you know, in talking about this, I just wanna bring up also that in the West, we don't recognize how much our thinking is imperialist thinking, even those of us who are anti-imperialists. And there's a whole, China and Asia are different cultures than the West. And we constantly project our own culture and our own thinking on Asia to try to think about it. And it's wrong. Um, we miss by, by projecting the, the violence and hate and militarism of the West that we are so steeped in, on China, we miss the beauty and we miss what it is, what it is not, you know, what it, look, the great book about never going to war is from China. Um, so, you know, it's, we, we, we project ourselves instead of really looking to understand. And I hope that part of this is that it whets your curiosity about what is China, what really is China. And um, not what is the propaganda of China or what has China been in the last, before the last decade. China changes faster probably than any place on the planet. I don't, I don't know of a place that changes faster. But when I, when I was a kid, um, when you were eating your meal, my parents used to say you have to finish because there's a starving child in China. That you know, in 1970, it was one of the poorest countries on the planet. It is now neck and neck with the United States. I met with women who remember their grandmother's bound feet. So, I mean, just take a minute to think about what that must feel like in a psyche, in a, in a, in a human that is experiencing that rapid change. And I can only relate it to coming of age, you know, going to school in 1970 and um, talking to my grandmother where, you know, from mo uh, automobiles to computers had happened in her lifetime from telephones. And think about what it felt like in the United States then where anything felt possible. And there was a sense of kind of buoyancy. I relate that to China right now. It's like when so much has changed and yet the dark side hasn't quite moved in yet. Um, and don't think China doesn't understand there's a dark side to where they are. And they, they are trying to take steps that I think we didn't take in the United States that understand power, the cost of power, that understand and respect that, um, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely that understand, uh, you know, one of the things China does is it learns. It pays attention and learns. It knows it's made a lot of mistakes and it's 
70 years into an experiment it that you know ends in i think 49 it's in an experiment it understands it's in an experiment united states is in an experiment i think sometimes we forget that we forget to pivot we forget to learn from our mistakes um it's china's learned from its mistakes it's learned from other people's mistakes so it and it learns in an interesting way like one of the things i learned while we've been doing this campaign is like in five different country, uh, uh, cities, uh, cities are as big as countries in China, it will try five different solutions to uh, five different ways to address a problem and then watch what happens and then, you know, take the one that has the best results and then everybody does it. But so think about that. Like, how does this work? How is it affecting the people? Um, listening. I mean, one of the things it does is listen to the people. Uh, there's a film that was made about how they took everyone out of poverty. It was a, um, a, a person in Wall Street that wanted to understand that. And he hired an Emmy Award winning filmmaker out of DC and took him to China. They took footage, came back, edited it, made the film, got PBS to produce it, showed it once. Uh, people watching felt it made Beijing look too good. And so it's been censored. Um, so, you know, uh, in it, you understand like how they make things happen. And it's on a very intimate level. Direct democracy is happening when you watch this, how they took people out of poverty. But it, you know, the, a responsibility to care for the people uh, is is an interesting thing to witness. And I also encourage everyone to go there to have their own experience because it is vast and the dip, and the experiences will be so different. Um, so that's you know a little bit of an an entry. I I also um, want to talk about um, Taiwan a little and this pivot, this last 20 years of propaganda in Taiwan of, of the commitment the United States has had, and we heard Lincoln come back with it again from his last trip, that there is one China. And that when the United States starts um, in, invading the idea of one China and trying to change it, it doesn't work out well for the people. It didn't work out for the, well for the people in Tibet when the CIA armed Tibet taught them to go to war and tried to get them to be the front line of war in China. It doesn't work out in Shenzhen when the United States goes to the, the King of Saudi Arabia and asks him to ra radicalize the Muslims. It doesn't work out well for Taiwan already and they have back channeled to the leadership of the US to say, shut up, stop lying about China invading Taiwan. Every person in China knows that China is not going to bomb itself, but you can get, you know, you can get the Americans to believe anything. So the Taiwanese say, you can't do that anymore because now that's got major contracts being canceled. It is affecting its economics. So let's just look at, you know, what happens when a country is used as a tool for war on another country. Ukraine. Taiwan is watching that and does not want to be Ukraine. So, you know, we'll we'll hear more about Taiwan from a professor uh, later in the week, but um, it's also one of the weeds, but it's also a place that we need to understand as people in the United States, even though Biden says, yes, we believe in a one China policy, and Blinken comes back and says, we will have nothing to do with Taiwan independence. They are still, all, you know, those are words, the behaviors matter and the behaviors are already hurting people, including the hate that they're driving. So um, I've given you a little, you know, ground to walk on. Um, and there's, what I'd really like to do is now bring in Wei. Wei Yu has been Code Pink's China's Not Our Enemy campaign coordinator and a lot of the things that you see on her site, um, she's created. She was born in Tianjin, China, um, a port near Beijing, and has lived in the United States since her high school years. 
Uh, when she was at university, she, she was after a degree in sociology and international studies and conducted an independent research project on neocolonial bias in the global north academia. She's worked with uh, several nonprofit organizations serving women, racial minorities, and other progressive causes. She's passionate about anti-imperialism and peace building work, and um, also is a vegan chef in her free time. So Wei, if you can um, bring, this, bring us into your story. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, uh, if you're in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so like Jody mentioned, um, I was actually born in China. Um, and since today we're talking about the 10 years of pivot to war um, on China, um, let's just go back in time a little bit and um, to the beginning of Obama administration's pivot to Asia. Um, so I was actually living in China at the time. I was 12 years old. Um, uh, and, uh, the, and it was also, I remember it was like the summer holiday right between my sixth grade and the, and seventh grade when I was supposed to start, um, uh, junior high school. And, um, that was the summer when I first got, um, politicized essentially. Um, that was one eventful summer that really opened up my eyes on a lot of international issues, um, mainly because there was this, um, the what what was on everyone's mind at the time was this um ter ter territorial dispute between China and Japan, um with uh, East China Sea and some islands, um and this is like a very like uh this is kind of like a weed like Jody mentioned and there's like a lot of historic, um issues and between the relations of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, historical issues in the relations between China and Japan, and I'm just not going to get into that. But I also remember that because there's so much history between the two countries there from um, the Japanese occupation of China in the 20th century, or the Japanese occupation of like much of East Asia in the 20th century, and also the Sino-Japan War um, back in the 1800s. Um, there's like just a lot going on between the countries, but then I remember seeing in the news and I was uh, questioning, why does the United States have something to say about this? Why is the United States being a provocateur in this situation and just escalating tension? Why is the United States sending warships all the way across the Pacific Ocean to have these military exercises with Japan? And it really just made me question about like, what is the whole thing about? Is there like an agenda behind it? And then um, I was just so confused and so afraid that entire summer. Cause like, like I mentioned again, it was the summer holiday. So I got a lot of free time. And what I ended up spending this free time I'm supposed to enjoy is that I just stayed at home and watched the news like the entire day. Um, and I remember um, the there was like a dedicated news channel, right? And they would have like a news program every hour and they are pretty much repeating the same thing because you're not going to get any news um, unless there's an update. But then I would still watch every repetition of that program at the top of every hour because I was just so afraid that maybe like oh, the war has already started and then I just don't know what's going on. And it was just again, just like a very fearful, very confusing summer and just questioning myself, like why is the United States involved and what it's its agenda to create fear and panic um, among people and among like little kids like me. Um, and then a couple of years later, um, I moved to the States and then a lot of like struggle with racism also, as well as um, xenophobia. But then um, like Jody mentioned, in a couple of days, we we're going to talk about like U.S. foreign policy and also how it affects Asian Americans. Um, but uh, my um, story, I have like the the most um, memorable thing for me. It was definitely during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we saw uh, in the news a lot of these um, anti-Asian attacks that are happening um, just randomly in the streets. And also a lot of them are targeting the elderly in the community, which is just very upsetting. Um, and I was also just very fearful about 
um, just going outside and that I might be the target of the next racist attack. Um, so I remember during that time because I was so afraid and then I was just trying to think of anything, anything that would keep myself safe. And what I did was that, um, cause I was in college. So every time I went outside, I would make sure to put on like a t-shirt or a sweatshirt with my college's name on it. So it goes like Jacksonville or like go JU, just like, so trying to like really Americanize myself and just dim down like my um, identity so that people would just hopefully ignore me and so that I could stay safe and looking back that's just like such silly thinking but in at the time I really thought that that's what's going to keep me safe from all of these racist attacks um, and recently I um, I was I was hanging out with my friend and her boyfriend just flew in town um, to visit her and her boyfriend is actually Afghan and um when he flew into town he was wearing this t-shirt that has like an American flag on his chest uh so he did that to avoid getting harassed at the TSA or at the airport and then I remember thinking I get it now <laughs> I'm I'm East Asian and then this is like a Middle Eastern uh man but like I get that feeling now and going back to what Jody said um, we saw we are seeing this propaganda and also this preparing for war to China, not unlike what we saw um, in Iraq 20 years ago. And I can tell you from like this individual experience, it really is like that. Um, and we just sort of had like this bonding moment, like even though like me East Asian and then him Middle Eastern, and we just have like this um, interesting experience of like, people that look like us are being attacked um, as this preparation for war going on. Um, and um, yeah, so today I just really want to like share my experience and um, also thank you so much for like Stan sharing like all the um, links in the chat and I'll hand back to Jody and I just hope you all like really take home with this experience like this this um my story with you is just that all of this preparation of war is really creating fear for people who are has not who wants nothing to do with them. Way, thank, thank you. you so much Jody. Thank you so so much. Um you're turning everything most people know on its head. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start with you, Wei. Um, what Jody described about how China organizes itself and the way that they're interpreting uh, the democratic principles of governance uh, is, is very unique. And I would love to hear from you as someone who grew up in China. What was your personal experience of uh, the Chinese polity. You know, we're consistently told uh, that it's a dictatorship. Uh, Joe Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator uh, just uh, a few days ago, that it's a totalitarian system, uh, that it's a police state. Um, uh, but what was your experience uh, as just an individual uh, uh, growing up over there? And how would you evaluate the uh, Chinese uh, form of governance in relationship to what Jody was saying? Yeah. Um, um, so while I was um, in China, I was, again, just like a child and just like really growing up. But then my experience was really just that this um, democratic process um, and the sanctity associated with it is just like so deeply instilled in my mind um when I was starting school um actually we would have like election within our class um every month so how my school did it was that um every month there's going to be an election for the best students of the month basically um we had around like 30 ish students in my class so we would elect two every month um, and you are just elected by your peers, right? Your teacher doesn't get a vote on it. Your parents don't get a vote on, 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 vote on it. It's really just like students um, voting on who they think deserve, 
the title of the best students. And it's not even like you're voting for your best friends. It's always every month. It's like the kids who get the good grades or the kids who are well-behaved in class, they are always getting elected. Um, and I remember there was one time, I think I was around like third grade, maybe. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting because um, on that day, we we're supposed to have like an art class. Um, and I so happened, um, I brought some like extra art supplies that day. And then I was like sharing it with my classmates because um, I was just, you know, being nice and like being nice to other kids. Um, and then our teacher walked into the classroom and seeing me passing out stuff. And that was also like an election day when we were supposed to vote for best student. Our teacher was like, that's bribing. That's not OK. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just got so scared I was like oh no I did something so terrible so really this like this like democratic value this like process um like you learn about it at a very young age you get to participate in it as soon as you start school at six years old and there's some sort of like sanctity associated with it like you just you it just it just can't be tainted you can't you obviously you can't bribe people and then you can't do any like thing that will make you suspicious of bribing um yeah that was just that was just like my experience like you you learn about this whole election at a very young age and then you get to practice it and also everyone's being fair thank you thank you so much jody i'd love to hear a little bit more because uh, you just came back from china uh, tell us a little bit about your trip over there and in particular what you were learning about how the Chinese society uh, at every level uh, self-organizes itself around various issues and concerns, because I think that is a, a, a sort of a foreign concept uh, to the way we understand democracy in the United States, which is an election every two or four years. Um, we don't have a sense of democracy at a family level or at a community level. Um, and the Chinese um, uh, have developed that over the eons of time. And I think our audience would be very interested in, in a deeper dive into your understanding of how they self-organize. Well, so I also just wanna comment on wasting, you know, what we was talking about voting. I don't think Americans understand that in the last election in China, 800 million people voted, which is a larger percentage than people who vote in US elections. So, you know, in the sense of like the value of elections, um, also that value, and that the political system is like the US system, it's you elect to select. So at the very end, the leadership is selected in this, I think with more people actually in the process, what we have 535 that select the president of the United States. I think it's a bigger number in China. I think it's 2000 and something. Um, so it's the same elect to select process that we have in the United States. Um, so just want to like when we um, if to understand that there's also two structures. There's the party and then there's the the running of the country. So the cabinet falls under the prime minister. And um, that's like the military, how things run, that's like one thing. And then the party's a totally different thing. And that's, she's the head of the party. He's not the head of the country. I also wanna say the party is only 90 million members. So, um, you know, just uh, people who think it's a dictatorship and a monoculture and the politic, the poly of China is more diverse than the United States. So just to say that, you know, that it's got all kinds of things in its threads, you know? And so at the very core of how the country run or is run is the same way it's been for 2,500 years. And that is locally. And so, you know, like I talked about the diversity, um, I, I can, ex I, my experience of this was my husband, who lives in Beijing, Shanghai, and Sanya, and his experience of COVID, the time of COVID. It depended on where you lived as your experience. The other thing is people talk about the China shutdown. I think five cities in China were locked down 
which totaled maybe 100 million people. It's a country of a billion five. So we also were fed a very narrow thread of what that COVID lockdown looked like. To most of China, there was no lockdown. Um, and to, and I also want to say, remember when I talked about the experiment, the experiment was happening in Shanghai. And another experience was happening in another city. Five different cities were doing it in five different ways. Shanghai was the worst. And that was in three months to figure something out. And I would say that probably contributed to like, okay, we have to open up, you know? And may I say that that looked like a failure, but he became the prime minister of the country after that. And I want to, you know, let's look at that, like, because why? Because he was willing to take the hardest task, to fulfill the hardest task, and help everybody understand something, and was rewarded for it. So, you know, failure is a big deal in China. It's like, when you take on what's going to be the failure, it's like you're seen as like, having courage, having commitment, like, being willing to do what has to be done, for everybody to learn. And, and like, I, I think that's, I, I found that super interesting because I was like, oh my God, this guy's gonna get canned. And then he becomes the prime minister. I'm like, oh, I don't understand anything. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm constantly reminded that my US mind does not do well. And as I try to figure out the, so I think, you know, which, you know, I'm, you know, goes to Biden and Blinken having no clue what's going on in China or having capacity to, to communicate. And I know that um, it's also very, their immaturity and, and manipulation and bullying don't play well with Chinese culture or characters. Um, so what happens is that, um, and, and again, 2,500 years of experience, what is real in your life happens locally. So people are more connected to what's happening locally. They're a part of that. You're part of your community. You have a responsibility to it. Somebody's like a community leader, but you listen to them. That's where, because they're all going to do it differently depending on the neighborhood you live in, what's needed, who's old, who's young, what the pushback is going to be. Um, because Chinese people, there's a lot of pushback. <laughs> there's a lot of like, I don't like that. I don't want that. So um, it happens locally and it happens in community and you're engaged. You go to meetings and, and once a week, you you know, where the poly happens is locally. And we see that with the, um, the taking the, you know, people out of poverty. It happened first person to person, and then it was about the community. And then what they delivered was infrastructure, not money. You know, money was the last thing. I don't know, way if you um, wanted, it seemed like in the chat, somebody wanted to see the film. If you could um, uh, share that, I think that inside that film, you get to see that the, the poly goes deep into what is the, the relationship, what is the personal experience? Because it's about serving the people. It's not about what is my idea and how do I go off and do it? Um, it's always iterating also, did that work, didn't that work? And um, I think one of the interesting things out of the, the film on taking people out of poverty is the understanding that that will, you're playing with that, thank you, Wei, um, you're playing with that problem all the time. And so, you know, coming from, Venice Beach, where I have 5,000 unhoused people in my neighborhood, to a country where I couldn't find a homeless person. And I said, where, you know, there must be homeless people, take me to them. And, you know, people looked at me crazy, like, of course, people fall through the fabric of society, but they're picked up. And maybe somebody's homeless for a day and at the most two before the community picks them up and they're taken to what's needed for them. And so, you know, just that concept of building a fabric of society that cares for everyone. And then the other thing is, is that, first of all, like China is so clean. I, I've decided there must be 2 million um, gardeners because the gardens are lush and you're, 
what happens to you? And I'm a gardener, so maybe that's, you know, I'm, you know, deeply moved by it in another way. But I, I really feel what happens to us when we see beauty is peace. Um, that I, I think it, it takes our heart to peace. And so to be in a place that cares so deeply about beauty is profound. And, and then to find what the community does in that beauty. Um, I live across from the park in, in, in Shanghai. And I just always go down like every hour to see what's happening in the park. So in the morning, there's a whole crowd and they're doing Tai Chi. And then there's like, I'm told I like have the books there help me know what's going on. There's then a whole bunch of parents come and they're doing matchmaking and they're bringing their kids and introducing their kids. And there's like this whole matchmaking thing that happens. And then there's always equipment in the park where people can exercise and you see all these you know, retired people working on the machines, knowing that they need to keep in shape, keeping in shape and eating is a big thing. You know, like she's like all about like, how do you eat? You know, because when you become modernized and, and wealthier, bad eating habits take form. So they try to work on exercise and eating. And then there's my favorite is that the old guys with their little tiny bird cages and their little tiny birds and they come and by trade bird cages and birds and it's just like so beautiful and they're so adorable um and so just like oh and then the game playing and you know and the women who just like have these crowds around them because they're, they know how to play the game better and everybody's watching I can't follow it but um it's just community happening and I you know that's steeped from the relationships you have from where you live that you know your neighbors that um, my friend Tings um, talked about how much they loved the lockdown because out of that the neighbors got to know each other better everybody was off running off to work and they created uh, things that still exist about how they order their food to the building at a discount price and then they all share it and they've like got into that ordering thing that's continued so as we know you know through COVID that we learned what is essential and some of those patterns have continued some of those things have continued out of the lockdown with those in China um so I hope that answered your question Jim oh beautiful 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 way would you add anything to what uh Jody said I, I think Jody said everything beautifully. <laughs> well, you know, I can uh, testify to that. I was actually born in China um, in 1951 in in uh, western uh, uh, Sichuan province, right near the Tibetan border, and then grew up uh, till I was about 15 in Taiwan. And I was always struck by the communal nature of Chinese uh, society and the constant interactivity uh, between parents and their kids and and families and compounds and uh, just a constant chatter of a communal nature uh, so that the individual is always identified relationally with a larger uh, collective so I'm not surprised, Jody, that with 1.5 billion people, there's no homelessness. Or that if there is homelessness, it happens uh, for a day or two before that collective closes in and uh, begins to ameliorate whatever that situation is and that, uh, that individual. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why Chinese civilization has lasted uh, for as long uh, as it has, um, you know, nearly four or 5,000 years of continuous Chinese history. And there's no country in the world uh, that even comes close to that level of uh, durability uh, over time. Uh, and one of the keys has been a collectivist, communal understanding of the individual, which is not a negation of the individual, but an understanding, just like in nature, we're identified not as separate, but as relationally always within 
a larger whole that scales. And uh, it's the capacity of a society to hold the different levels of interactivity and identity that really marks um, longevity. And that is one of the great teachers, I think, for uh, not going to war. <laughs> and the reason why uh, China, if you compare it uh, uh, with the United States, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, just a fraction of the uh, hostilities uh, that the United States has experienced. And I'd like to turn to that whole domain, and I'd like to fill out what, what you said a little bit uh, uh, with a comparison of the, the U.S., Chinese, and also Russian military budgets, uh, because it was just released not long ago that the United States uh, this year is spending more on its military than the next 10 countries combined. The United States runs at about $800 billion officially, but there's another couple, 200, 250 billion that's in what they call the dark budget. So you have a, a generally understood as a military budget by the United States of around a trillion dollars. China is second, and the official Chinese budget was under 300 million. So the United States is spending three times the Chinese. It's very important for but people. But the Chinese to, have five times the population. With five times the population. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also important to bear in mind that the Russian military budget was only $48 billion. So the United States is spending 20 times what the Russians are spending on their military. And right now, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, it's the combined military capacity of the United States and NATO going against Russia that is at the heart of the asymmetry in that conflict and is one of the reasons why the Russians keep saying, we're going to keep it moderate, but if you start overwhelming us, we will use nuclear weapons. And it is the lack of appreciation of the, of the, of the gravity of that on the part of most Americans that feeds this exuberance, this irrational exuberance uh, around um, war. And if you correct me, uh, Jody and, and Wei, but I, uh, if my understanding is that uh, China went to war against Vietnam uh, after the Vietnamese War um, for a very, very brief period of time. There were hostilities in Tibet but you could count, I think, the number of Chinese military operations on one hand. Man, let's talk about provoking in a war. You know, so if there's, uh, we should, I think this is an important thing to witness, is that when provoked, when things, you know, it, it was, they both came out of a provoking, not out of a you know, peace was happening and then provoking started happening. Yeah, oh, for so, sure, for sure. So I just wanna, you know, war is what the United States does on innocent people. Like, to me, I think if there's, you know, because people talk about peace, like defending oneself, um, you know, if we look at, you know, what happened with Putin and Ukraine, it's like, I don't wanna war, I don't wanna war, I don't wanna war. And if you get closer, there's going to be a war and then if you continue to arm Ukraine, it's, I've got to come in before it's fully, you know, like you're going to force me to move. There's, you know, I, China, when provoked, will act to protect itself. I would say that's most places. So we really need to understand about provoking. Um, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. Self, yeah, yeah, for sure. Horrific Ukraine is. And it was that it was, this did not have to happen. And, and that's the importance of this campaign that I really want to say is that provoking 
you know, will cause, I mean, China has been through hell. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's years of, you know, indignity forced on it by Europe and the United States and Japan. Um, and just, I saw also not the valuing, I mean, just also never being valued um, or recognized for what, you know, so it provoked, it will act and, and it's shown that. And I think that's important to know um, that, uh, you know, that the United States was part of that provoking in Tibet. Oh, uh, for sure. And I was raising it that if you think that pro provoked or not, if you think of the Chinese using military maybe less than five times uh, in the last uh, 50 years, I think the latest estimate is that the United States has used military action one way or another over 250 times in the last 30 years alone. What the important thing about this, Jim, is, is that every war that the US gets into, the rich get richer. So it loses the wars, the country loses the war, the people lose the war, the people spend the money on the war and they get nothing back for it, but the rich get richer. So the US yes. makes on war. I mean, look, I, the talk to people in Europe right now, they are losing in this war but they are tied, they are yoked to the United States. So they're losing. But the United States, it wins in war, including the civil war, the rich got richer. So China, you know, when we're talking about the philosophy that they run on, it's a win-win philosophy. You know, everyone mm -hmm. in China knows the, it's like that philosophy, that, that part of your culture is like, in how they relate. It's like, it's got to be win-win, right? And so they lose in war. And so in the China mind, war is a lose. It's like, you know, it's in the art of war, it's a lose. That is in their culture. And they actually do lose. They don't, they're not set up to make bank on war. The United States is set up from the beginning to make bank on war. And, you know, I, I love that um, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. is bringing, you know, really bringing up his uncle and his, his race, which for nothing else, his race, you know, is raising up peace. And um, one of the things his uncle knew because he listened to Eisenhower was the job of the president was to keep the break on the military congressional, Eisenhower called it the congressional military industrial complex. He knew, he knew because when he became president and he saw what they had done to North Korea, to Korea, and then you know, he created North Korea, he cried, he cried and said, stop this. You know, we saw what happened with our dear Daniel Ellsberg, who was with us in our first summit and has left this planet, but, um, uh, you know, in such dignity and grace, you know, exposing the, the lies of Vietnam and how horrific that was, that it, it turned the stomach of people who had been in that war. So um, I think this is really important for us to know when we're being used by the State Department, we're really being used by those who make a killing on killing. And taking in that propaganda is just so you can be fodder for war also. Um, I, you know, I, we look at war, you can't end war till you end the war economy because war serves the war economy. And I wanna just say, since I brought Daniel into the room, that I learned something from Daniel's death and being with him over those last three months of his dying. The dignity and grace and the fierceness. And so we look out and, and you know, I hear fears of, yeah, uh, I could say the folly of fretting and people fretting and climbing into their corners and oh my God, oh my God. 
in Danny's life, he knew the truth about all of it, about nuclear weapons, about war, about the violence of the culture, about the society and its violence. And he never lost his grace or his dignity. And he never mm. quit talking until his last breath. And I just want to raise that up. That, mm. you know, no matter what happens, to not he never went into fear. He never got used by it. He was just beauty, dignity, and grace till the very end. And I, I long to follow in his footsteps because that's what we need right now. It's not to be caught up in the fear, not to be caught up in the separation, but to know what we know and share it as a service to peace. And he never stopped doing that. So we come together in these, you know, with humanity rising for all of us to be a tuning fork. I mean, I hear things like things should be this way, things should be that way. It's us. It is only us. It is, you know, it's how we enter the world, how we share with friends. Because, you know, when we started, Sam was talking about a movement. You know, right now, the movement for beasts is being silenced. I just came from the halls of Congress. I met with 30 members of Congress or did a teach-in in, in that many offices. They, it's like inside those halls of Congress, they're not allowed to talk about peace. They get buzz sawed, is, as one said, buzz sawed for bringing up peace. And inside of each office is an embedded member of the military that's called a um, military fellow in these offices that is at every meeting talking about how many more weapons we're gonna buy and how much more, we more we're gonna be engaged in. And there, I had one member of Congress staff say to me, as I was telling them what I you know, saw in China, she was like, well, we know better than you because we get briefed by the State Department. And I was just like, whoa, I came back. I'm sharing stories from the ground, but you are listening to the State Department who's taken us to wars, who's driven this hate, who are irresponsible. And I mean, like, just so you know, it is really up to us that you've got to be able to look at this. They're lost. I mean, Jim's very kind and, and saying, you know, they're insane. This is insane. And we have to recognize that. And I think one of the lessons I take from China is they recognize things early. And we know as human beings that when we recognize the problem early, we have a much better chance of having a soft landing than when we avoid, ignore, deny, and then get crushed by it. So if we recognize that China is not our enemy, that this is a war we could stop, it's really about each one of us changing the hearts and minds of those we know because China is not our enemy. It's wrong to make enemies. China knows better than to make enemies. It's, you know, when have we, how are we gonna, in this democracy that is broken, you can't have democracy when there's this much inequality and there's no real journalism can have democracy. But we're about to enter our, <laughs> being swept away by that game. It is a game that is, you know, definitely managed by those that are in power. When trillions of dollars are spent on election, you have to understand who owns those politicians. And I mean, I was in Congress, the military industrial complex owns those politicians. They speak like they're on their staffs. They're, they're asking for more than the Pentagon asked for. They're trying to be heroes. This is, this is grotesque. And the politic is infected with militarism and war and violence. And we need to be the healthy cells. We need to be the healthy cells and we need to do it with joy and love, no expectation of outcome because we have no idea how deep people are in the manipulation of this propaganda. It takes time, it takes our patience. So it's just that be imbued by the peace and the information that we continue to share because we want to give you strong ground to stand on so that you can share and be 
tuning forks for peace, tuning forks for, for cooperation. The planet needs it, the people need it, we all need it. And um, I just wanna say it's a beautiful place to live your life from. Um, as a peace activist, I know there are many listening that it's also a very beautiful life. Thank you, Jody, so much. That's a beautiful way, to, I think, to end our program uh, uh, today. I would just make a one or two quick comments and then maybe Wei, you can have a final word and then Jody, you can tee us up for uh, tomorrow. And that is that this month marks the 60th anniversary of the speech that President John Kennedy gave at the American University uh, in 1963. Uh, which is one of the most extraordinary speeches that I believe any American president has ever made about the issues of war and peace. And if you would just Google it, uh, America, uh, John Kennedy, uh, American University uh, speech, 1963, it's easily um, accessible. And then compare it with something that is coming out of the US Congress or coming from Joe Biden, uh, you'll see the truth of what Jody is saying, that the entire polity of the governance of the United States uh, is caught up in the war machine. And uh, if you would watch this movie called 13 Days, which is a Hollywood production on the Cuban Missile Crisis in October. There were 13 days in October 1962 um, where we came very close to nuclear war and everybody wanted to go nuclear. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, most of the cabinet. And it was only John and Bobby Kennedy uh, and Adelaide Stevenson, who was the ambassador to the United Nations that stood up against that rising momentum and discerned a way toward a political solution. And John Kennedy was so unnerved by not only the power of the military industrial complex, even against him as president of the United States, that he began negotiations with Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party and the, uh, then the Soviet Union, to begin uh, negotiations that led to the nuclear test ban treaty uh, in 1963. And it was in advance of that uh, signing of that treaty that he gave this extraordinary speech about understanding those that we hold as enemies and valuing that they also have a point of view. And what he said was crucial in terms of what we're experiencing today in Ukraine. He said, in a nuclear world, you never want to place your adversary who has nuclear weapons in a position of either surrender or using those weapons. And that is the position that increasingly the United States is putting Russia today. Uh, but there's nobody in the White House with the elegance and the wisdom of John Kennedy. That's what we need. And we also need it uh, uh, around uh, China. So when Jody connects in the spirit of Daniel Ellsberg, who since the 1960s has, has been an indefatigable warrior uh, against the use of nuclear weapons and for peace, um, we all need to do whatever we need to, uh, to imbibe that spirit, because that spirit is the only thing that's going to uh, lead us through. It's an extraordinarily subtle political history of uh, the 1960s that are well worth examining and studying, particularly Kennedy's speech uh, at the American University, uh, if we want to know 
the posture and disposition that we need to embrace uh, today um, because the world has never been more dangerous uh, since that time as it is right now. Uh, and we need to embody uh, the kind of enlightenment uh, that is required. So thank you for raising uh, that and for your comments, Wei. So let's start with you. Any final words that you would like to make, Wei, and then you, uh, Jody, and then we'll close it out. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim, for um, having me here. Like you said, like this is really scary time, but then that's why that's what makes me appreciate even more about these like forums, these events that we're having. It really makes us feel that um, there's a movement. There's a lot of us all together um, in this trying to make peace. Um, and um, what Jody said like a bit earlier really stuck with me is that um, they see this as a game, right? Yeah. Um, um, in April, the House Select Committee on China, they actually had this war game um, about like, they basically planned out how a conflict with China over Taiwan would look like. And it, they literally saw everything as pieces on the chessboard. Um, and that just like takes away the humanity um, of, of people like of China, of people in the US, just everyone. And then um, it's very important that here we're having like these conversations and all of you here hearing my story that making us realize that oh, we're just all people and we're just all humans and all connected. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Wei. Jody, final word. Thank you, Wei. Yeah, I think Wei said it, you know, that all this talk I call the weeds takes us away from our humanity. We know better. We know it's like we then we give away our own common sense, our own heart feelings to all this information that we don't understand and we think is true because we think the state, you know, we think people have our best interests at heart. And I think it's just like coming back to who are we as humans? And that's what this campaign is about. Let's be relational to each other. Um, and so in China, not being our enemy, what, what is like, why not have the curiosity to what is China instead of what are you being fed as China? And tomorrow we're gonna get more of that. Um, so with KJ and Mika, uh, so I, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. There's many more layers of this story um, before we finish the week off. So thank you for joining us, peace. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Wei. Uh, thank you all. Uh, that brings our session to a close for today. Uh, as a reminder, it's just the first day of a five-day program here on Humanity Rising in partnership with Code Pink. You're all welcome to the after-session chat, and we'll see uh, everyone tomorrow for day two, same time, same station. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>